from the ground, um, from the ground. It really and it was a really me, scary thing for me. And my teacher got me to go through it. And I can remember the first time I did cry. No way. <laughs> yeah, crying for about 30 minutes afterwards. And I just couldn't Why? stop. Why? Just because it's, it's, mas- it's such a massive emotional release. And it just, different parts of the practice bring up issues inside of you. Um, and it's just, I think for me, it was, I think for me it was an issue of trusting person, another person. And I was like person, trusting another person to, to take me through the safely, to take me through and, the safely and to catch me if I was going to fall. Was, and it um, was, it just hit, um, it, just touched hit nerve, it touched on a nerve. Yeah, and I, was, yeah, it was um, really healing. And that's Alison DeMeo. And this is the Yoga Life podcast. Hello there, welcome to episode 21 with Ashtangi underscore Ali, as she's known on Instagram, or Alison DeMeo. So Ali is a yogi that comes to my classes, or used to come to my classes. She's um, she's an interesting one because she's the first person I've had on the podcast who is has a full-time job and really full-time. She's an OBGYN. Um, where she works very long hours, shift work, but yet she manages to maintain really consistent practice. She maintains a really consistent Instagram, and she's um, yeah, it's interesting to see how someone juggles the two. So in this episode, we talk about life as an OBGYN. So there was some um, eye-opening things for me. Also, uh, her experience with Ashtanga the benefits that she feels practicing in a Mysore room, physical adjustments, and and how Ashtanga has helped her in her life. So I hope you enjoy it. If you do, as always, please leave a review. It's actually quite tricky to leave a review on Stitcher, so I think the best bet is to leave a review on iTunes. If you could leave a rating and a review, it could be just like, like this podcast or this podcast was okay. Whatever it is, I'd appreciate feedback. Also, you can reach me... Um, on my Instagram, Kevin Ball Yoga, or send us an email. All details on my website. All right, have a good one. Enjoy. Hi, Ali. Hi, Kev. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Not too bad. Can't complain. Are you enjoying your mint tea? I love my mint tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you enjoying your mint tea? I am, yeah, but we've got to be careful we don't knock it over because there's no electronics. So much electronics around. <laughs> I'm going to keep it right there yeah, in the middle. So where you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fairly clumsy person, so just keep an eye on me. <laughs> okay. So, Ali, um, mm. why Ashtanga? Ooh. Ooh. Deep, deep end. <laughs> Straight into it. Oh my gosh, why Ashtanga? Because you were just persuaded, not persuaded me, you yes. were suggesting I try Ashtanga. Yeah. And I have tried of... it once before, so... Yeah, I think I'm kind of a, uh, what are they called? Yeah, I'm a bit of an Ashtanga, uh, oh, I don't know, disciple. Yeah. <laughs> Always trying to spread the word. But um, no, I found Ashtanga kind of coincidentally. I was living in Limerick um, and practicing vinyasa and various forms of yoga and everything was kind of amazing. I was trying to get stronger. Um, and then I found this teacher called Christine who um, introduced me to Ashtanga. Um, and it kind of just stuck with me ever since then. And uh, it's kind of been a rapid love affair. Um, I I like everything about it. Like I really like practicing in a Mysore room. So that's where um, a, the teacher kind of comes around and gives adjustments to everyone. Everyone's doing their own practice um, from a set sequence, but we're all practicing to a different degree or a different point in the series. Um, and they come around and they give kind of individual attention and individual adjustments. Um, mm. So it's very meditative because you're not kind of listening to the cues from the teacher. You're just diving into your own body, yeah. um, which is cool. Makes sense. Um, and there's a discipline to it. Like I really like discipline. I like structure. <laughs> I'm kind of somebody who needs structure in my life because I'm not good at giving it to myself. Um, so it's it suits me really nicely. And there's... A very linear progression through the sequence so like you are given the next posture as you show proficiency in the preceding posture um, and you can't really move on so sometimes people get stuck at a posture for a long time and it can really challenge you 
So like mm -hmm. you might get stuck at like Mary Chasana D for years. Um, and that can just really um, play on the ego and <laughs> challenge um, preconceived notions of yourself. And you see all kinds of really emotional um, breakthroughs happening in the Mysore room, um, which is really cool. Like I had that myself with back bends um, and facing into drop backs with my teacher. So drop backs are where you're kind of standing and you go into Urdhva Danyarasana or into a back bend, into wheel essentially. Um, from the ground and it was a really scary thing for me and my teacher got me to go through it and I can remember the first time I did it crying. No way. <laughs> yeah, crying for about 30 minutes afterwards and I just couldn't stop. Why? Just because of this mash. It's such a massive emotional release and it just different parts of the practice bring up issues inside of you. Um, right. And it's just I think for me, it was an issue of trusting another person. And I was like trusting another person to, to take me through this safely and to catch me if I was going to fall. And it was, um, it just hit, it touched on a nerve and I, yeah, it was, um, really healing. And, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of things about the practice I love. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. But so what level, cause there's different stages and there's, uh, what level are you at in terms of one, two, I'm not too clued up on Ashtanga. Yeah, so there's different sequences or different series. So everyone, series, that's it. Yeah, yeah, everyone starts with Surya Namaskar. So you do your sun salutations and then you get into the fundamental asanas, which are things like Trikonasana and Parjvakanasana, things that you see in all yoga classes. Um, and then you get into primary series and primary series, well, a lot of people think it's really basic because it's the first one you learn. It's actually I think the most difficult. Um, it incorporates a lot of deep forward folds. It incorporates strengthening um, arm balances, crazy back bends. Um, so I kind of did that. Um, and I was sitting on primary series for, I think about nine months before I got moved on to second series, which is where I am now. I'm kind of working my way through second series. Mm. Um, and at the moment, I'm at Ekapadish or Shasana, which is putting a leg behind my head. <laughs> that, that's never going to happen for me. Uh, that <laughs> never one. say never. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can. I can. When I try and go for it, it really hurts my lower back. But I, yes. I think it's the things that we avoid that we've, we, you know, things we're not good mm. at, we tend to avoid them. And maybe yeah. that's the actual where discipline comes in. Yes. We have a set series, so you can't avoid anything. Mm -hmm. um, when you're doing your own self-practice, I like to focus on arm balancing because I'm better at that. Right. But then leg behind the head is, is being neglected. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I asked about the series because um, someone said to me the other day, they referred to someone, they said, uh, oh, he's, he's on the third series mm -hmm. of Ashtanga. And I just said, I didn't know how to react. I was like, ooh, like, is that good or bad? I don't know. Yeah. And, I felt, and then I looked at their reaction to see what they were, and they were like, as in that's impressive. So mm -hmm. I kind of nodded, um, pretending I knew what they were talking about. Um, but um, so how many series are there? There's six in total. So I, what they say are, there's a quote I've heard that primary series is for students, second series is for teachers, and anything beyond that is for demonstration or for the circus or you know it's just kind of crazy stuff uh -huh. um so in the shallow that i practice at at the moment um most people are working on primary series to varying degrees um a few people are doing second series and i think there's one or two that are doing full second series um i had never actually seen anybody do third series until i went on a retreat recently and I was just blown away. Like it's it's crazy stuff. It's full of like behind the head and arm balances and yeah. kind of transitions from things like headstand into a different arm balance. And it's really cool. So I think, um, you know, if you think of people like Kino McGregor, yeah. she's at the moment working through fifth series, I believe. Wow. So like she's not even doing the full, um, proc or she's not doing all of the series. And I think there's one person currently practicing all of the series and that's Sharat Joyce and he's the lineage holder of the Ashtanga mm. um, practice now I these are things I've read online I don't know how true they are <laughs> <laughs> um, so if anyone fact checks me I'm sorry if I get it wrong <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, harass me about it later but um <laughs> and does it incorporate um like arm balancing handstands mm. that type of thing yeah there is arm balancing so like you were saying yourself like there's 
there's nothing that you can get away from. You have to yeah. um, force yourself through different things. Like I got stuck at Bija Padasana for long. So that's for a long time. That's where you have to put your legs around your shoulders and cross your feet in front of your arms and your arm, you're doing an arm balance yeah, there. Yeah. And like, I just couldn't do it. I would, you know, you have to lower down to the ground from this. And I just kept banging my face off the ground and <laughs> <laughs> I nearly broke my nose on several occasions. Like it's, yeah, it was a real struggle for me. Yeah. Um, but then other things came easier. So mm -hmm. there's something in the sequence to challenge everyone, which mm -hmm. I think is really, I think it's important to be challenged in yoga. I don't think yoga is there to make you feel good. I think mm -hmm. it's to I, for me personally, I like a yoga that challenges me because it forces me to dig inside and to figure out what it is that's the root cause of any unhappiness in my life. So mm -hmm. it's good for that. Yeah, that's in, it's interesting you say that because what I've been saying recently in my class is, see, I, I'm, I'm in a, I, this is the first time I've said this actually, but I'm in a, a position now where I, through my training I was told to always make things um, don't be too adventurous in what mm. you're teaching people because you'll scare them off right. and they'll think oh I can't do that therefore I'm not going to come to this class again and I have been, played it quite safe for the first part of my my long career <laughs> <laughs> my short careers um, but hopefully it's going to be long and um, but what I've, I've come to realize is that I'm going to teach what I enjoy teaching, what I enjoy mm -hmm. doing myself, because that's the truest way of, the way I see it is like, I, I, I share what I enjoy doing, mm -hmm. what I get the most from, what I get a buzz from, for want of a better word. And when I teach that in class, like I've been teaching a lot of complex arm balance sequences lately, um, I notice some people are getting frustrated mm -hmm. and some people are getting maybe even angry, mm -hmm. um, annoyed. Um, but I've, I preface the class by saying that's part of yoga, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I avoided yoga for ages because I thought, oh, it's just about calming your mind and breathing and it sounds boring. It does. Yeah. Um, but then when I seen people doing arm balance and I thought, well, that looks interesting. And I realized that you can actually experience loads of emotions during yoga. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was lacking in life because I used to work in an office where we didn't speak at all. It was completely silent in the office. We'd const we'd, we'd, we'd con uh, communicate via instant message. No way. Oh yeah, everything was done <laughs> via instant message. Sitting Even next to somebody instant messaging them. Yep. God. And I thought uh, I was, thought I was going to go mad I was like I need to feel stuff so I used to uh, go to jiu-jitsu every morning and mm -hmm. which is a grappling sport I'm sure everyone knows that and then when I started going to yoga and combined the two I was like wow this is yoga is like a martial art against yourself yeah almost yeah you know I'm stealing that from Joe Rogan by the way he said that <laughs> first but I thought this is great I can I can actually do this on my own at home mm -hmm. and I'm experiencing like uh, anger sometimes, excitement when we're handstand, for example, um, sadness, uh, mm. calmness, um, and all those emotions. And I think that's uh, it really important that people know that. Yeah. Um, and so that's an interesting point you make. Um, Definitely. Like, I think that um, the yoga practice, for me, I think it's a mirror into, uh, to look at ourselves. So, you know, how we deal with adversity so how do we deal with something that's really difficult you know do we give up or do we go home and research it and try and figure out where our weaknesses are to fix the issue um or do we get angry or do we cry or what is it and mm -hmm. why are we acting like why are we reacting that way um and then i think from there you can get down into the patterns of thought and the patterns of behavior that come up over and over again in your body or in your mind and then hopefully you can peel away those layers and get down into the true stuff, which I think is the real point of yoga, which is peeling away those layers, peeling away the ego, mm -hmm. um, and just getting into whatever is inside of us. Yeah. Yeah. And and do you um, because your although your 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 practice is very developed and you seem to be very consistent with it according mm -hmm. to Instagram, <laughs> um, you you're a doctor, aren't you? Yes. 
<laughs> just just throw that in. Um, it's but, my job, yes. <laughs> what, what is an? Actually, I was going to Google this, and I thought I'm not. I'll wait till I ask you. What does OBGYN stand for? Okay, so OBGYN. That's actually kind of an American acronym because I'm an American, but I live in Ireland. But um, OBGYN stands for Obstetrician Gynecologist. So the okay. So it's not actually an acronym. It's kind of um, an abbreviation. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Chopping the the ends of both words off. Mm -hmm. So the obstetrician side is delivering babies and looking after women in pregnancy. GYN is looking after women kind of through various points in their lives and um, issues that they might have with their reproductive health, yeah. um, essentially. So, um, yeah, it's a great field of medicine to work in. It's, for the most part, really happy. Um, I work with a lot of amazing people. It's kind of very female-oriented, which I like. I like working with... Um, women and um, seeing them kind of from their early stages of life, first periods, issues with first periods, all the way over to 90 year old ladies who are having um, difficulties with consequences of having babies and just. 90 year olds? 90 year olds, yeah. <laughs> Nine, hold on a second. 90 year old women having consequences for having babies? Yes. That's a bit of a delay, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. There's a lot of things that, um, you know, you have your babies in your 30s, sometimes for, 20s, 30s, 40s, um, and there can be damage caused in childbirth. Yeah. Um, and sometimes women, especially Irish women, um, at least in the past, they didn't address it. Um, they just thought it was a part of aging and they thought it was just something they had to deal with and they didn't want to talk about it with anybody, especially like their GP who might be a man or usually would be a man um, up until recently. So um, it's kind of, things are changing a little bit slowly, but yeah, women are um, getting a little bit more in touch with their bodies now yeah. than they used to be, but uh, yeah, so we see 90 year olds coming in with various issues. I don't know how in depth wow. we should get about that. <laughs> well, it, 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 I, I mean, I've had a um, shout out to Jenny Keane who was on here. Yes. Basically, Jen, Jenny um, opened my mind to things I didn't even know existed. Mm. So, um, and um, I don't, I'm sure that's a lot of, uh, same for a lot of men, and maybe even some women. Mm. Um, so, you, you, I mean, you're welcome to go as in depth as your, how can I put it, professional. Um, side allows you to oh yeah sure yeah, but, also, uh, but i mean I, uh, th i'm not sc uh, screamish and and what i love about this medium is it's like completely up to us good. you know we can say what we like and i think i've said it to you before <laughs> um i don't i'm not squeamish at all i one part of one side effect of being a doctor is that like i don't know where the line into polite conversation <laughs> <laughs> where that where polite conversation ends and things that are a little bit rude start so um, <laughs> so if you're at din if you're at dinner you've got to watch rude. yourself when you yeah. <laughs> share your stories well it depends who i'm meeting with but yeah. like if i'm having dinner with the midwives or other doctors sure we talk about everything yeah. but uh yeah it's a it's a cool job um it definitely makes um practicing yoga a little bit tricky um in terms of finding the time but or make it's more about making the time i think well, uh, what you were saying that you you just come off a 12-day shift oh yeah so Is I, that 12 days in a row 12 days in a row um and some of those were long long old shifts like 12 13 hour shifts but you just kind of have to make it work so like you know i find time usually in the mornings like early morning do a yoga practice go to work in bed by nine o'clock <laughs> very boring life i don't have much of a social life but uh i do the things that i like to do so yeah yeah i'm happy and you used to come to my class and now you don't come anymore i keep meeting too i'm, call I'm, call I'm calling you out <laughs> i am um, yeah <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm gonna be coming back no your class i love it for um moon days so like on moon days i don't practice ashtanga or i'm not meant to practice ashtanga sometimes i do um, you're not meant to practice ashtanga on the moon day no so on a full moon or a, a new moon you don't practice because um i think it has to do with fluctuations and energy in the body and like okay. a full moon tomorrow's a full moon of course, and yeah. they say that your energy levels are very high and you're um, you're more likely to be very rajasic, I, th I think is what it's called. So really high energy. Um, and you can injure yourself essentially, um, oh. by just pushing too hard. Um, and I 
I don't know. I didn't for a long time. I was really skeptical of all of that, but I do kind of feel the effects of the moon. I don't know. Is it a bit of placebo effect? I'm kind of thinking about the moon and I'm feeling higher energy because of it, but yeah. I think there's something there maybe. Um, so anyways, yeah, we don't practice full moons or new moons. And so I like going to your class <laughs> on those days because <laughs> yeah. you let me do fun things like play around with arm balances that are not <laughs> allowed in Ashtanga. <laughs> <laughs> and moon salutations. Yes, yeah. yeah. I need to get it. I need to learn those. They're actually. so good, aren't they? They're so good because yeah. there's very little lateral mov movement in Ashtanga, like mm. almost none. Mm -hmm. And that's something I really need because, yeah. Well, I, speaking of movement, I've started teaching um, a lot of mobility stuff in class mm. because end range motion strength. Um, and this is a lot of stuff I've been inspired by Dice, mm. um, Dicey Decline. Uh, podcast alumni I can say now. <laughs> check out the podcast <laughs> yeah exactly episode 10 scroll back <laughs> not yet though wait till the end of this one and then um, but um, and it's funny I said to him in, in the, our teacher training that I was on recently if someone says to you is this yoga how would you explain it mm. how would you say like this doesn't look like yoga when you're doing it you know traditional um, postures mm. and, he, and he said it's your intention behind it you know yeah. are you mindful while you're doing it um and uh, and that's why I've I've started to introduce things that are outside the box because I feel that, or from a physical point of view, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, mm. you're if you're, and you're not progressing, even if it's, even if it's the same motion, but you're not uh, increasing the resistance or the tempo, you're not going to see any physical progress. Okay, and and also as well for your mind. I mean, I like creativity. I mm. like to strengthen the body in different ways and um, you talk about lateral movement but there's also mobility dynamic movement you can do in yoga like mm -hmm. I was recently teaching a switch lunge so you, one leg is for one leg is back and then instead of like taking the leg up and going through a sun salutation to get onto the other leg you just put your hands on the floor jump switch like a Russian lunge no, no way. yeah take cool. one leg back jump up in the air and switch the legs right and people were looking around like what, what's this <laughs> you know this is like a fitness class yeah but I thought like, and I, I have that a bit of insecurity. I'm, I'm thinking, I want to be you know, like, I want to feel like a legitimate yoga teacher, mm. but at the same time, I want to teach my style, and my style isn't uh, very floaty, mm -hmm. or which I, I mean, there's a lot of room for floatiness, um, <laughs> but um, um, so I think in order to look after the healthier body and your mind, it's important to to switch uh, things up. Um, speaking of which, mm -hmm. you went on a retreat recently. You just come back for a retreat. Yeah, I just got back from Portugal. rock climbing. I went rock climbing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a rock climbing retreat now. <laughs> but I did go once rock climbing. It so was it was cool. an Ashtanga intensive? Yeah, it was um, a summer school is what it was called. So it, was, it wasn't a teacher training or anything like that. But it was a place for us to go and learn. Um, so... Mm -hmm. The teacher is Luke Jordan and his wife as well, Sonia Redvilla. So there are two people that have been teaching Ashtanga for 20 plus years. Um, really, really incredible people um, with a lot of knowledge. And Luke's background is also um, in, I think, Hindu philosophy or Indian philosophy. Um, so he, after our morning Mysore practice, so we'd go and we'd do our asana practice for about two hours, so mm. however long it takes, um, have a breakfast, and then we'd sit around and do some chanting and then talk about philosophy for a while. Um, so he was calling it chants and rants. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, mostly him going on about a, a certain topic, but it was so interesting and it was just really great to spend two weeks, I was there for two weeks, um, two weeks with people that are like-minded and um, really into the practice of yoga and diving deeper into it um, and just really open-minded people. So um, very non-judgmental group of people. It was really special. Mm. Um, I think it's hard in this society to meet people that are open-minded and willing to talk about things without judgment. Um, even amongst the the yoga community, people can be a little bit like, oh, that's not yoga. Like you were saying, like, that's that's not yoga. This is yoga. Um, why are you exploring that thought mm -hmm. or that topic? Like, um, but these people were all very lovely. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was a great little experience to do. And I'll definitely do it again next year. 
Um, he does it every year. So mm. he's kind of built a home in Portugal and um, he's, he'll be open to having people down mm. every year. So it'll be cool. There's but. something so, so nice about with, with my teacher training, getting up in the morning, mm. empty stomach, um, sitting around with a bunch of people that are there for the same reason as you. Yeah. We did the same. We sang, we chant, chanted, uh, we did loads of pranayama techniques, mm. and then we did yeah, about an hour and a half practice. Nice. Um, and it was just every, that every day, and I was thinking to myself, imagine if you could do this every day, yeah. it'd be phenomenal. It really, and it's, yeah. it's, 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 all, it's the, one of it is the, I mean, and obviously the level of teaching, I mean, Dice and Bryony, I mean, Bryony, they're on another level, mm-hmm. like, so their creativity and the music and, you know, I, I actually, um, at one stage during one practice, I had the feeling I had, I haven't had that since I was in like right when I was in my raving days in Ibiza from the dance floor. No way. <laughs> yeah, I was high. I was wow. actually high. The music was pumping and it was like some like banging dance tune. I think it was um, Bonobo or they could, they're a band called Bonobo. It was sure. a banging tune. And um, we were doing a handstand. They were like, okay, just like a minute or so of handstands. Yeah. I was pumping sweat. I was looking around. Everyone was doing it. I was like, this is just like when I was on basically tons of ecstasy in, mm-hmm. in, in Ibiza. <laughs> um, but this is free. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no come down. And I thought, wow, this is what it can be like. Yeah. Um, but but to to do that every day is and have that sense of community is so powerful. Um, you mentioned John at um, yeah at, at your ship Sashada in um, in Dorset not Dorset uh, Street Baggett Street, Baggett Street. Yeah. Um, what what what's what's it was do you like about him? Um, well, I think John is a really special teacher. Um, a lot of Ashtanga teachers um, push a lot, so they they kind of push you to get into that fold deeper, to lift up, jump higher, you know, like really um, pushing, which I, I like, um, but it also, for me, I already do that to myself. So I don't, I don't need that much external driving force. Um, so John is quite the opposite. Like he creates this really nice atmosphere in the shala and he kind of just sits back and lets you practice. And if he sees that you're kind of going through something <laughs> he knows that there's something going on he'll kind of just step back and let that happen like mm-hmm. you know there's times when I've come to the shallow after work and you know I've had something horrible happen at work and I just kind of need to do my practice and just get out those feelings and he'll just let he'll sit back and let that happen um, and kind of do the adjust me as necessary but for the most part it just leaves me alone mm. um, but he has a way, like he doesn't do that to everyone, of course, like if there's people that are struggling with things, he'll help them. And he's just very gentle. And I think he's a little bit more into the other limbs of yoga other than asana. Mm. So he really likes to talk about the breath and the bandhas and staying, you know, keeping the breath low and steady and constantly moving and not kind of just chasing an asana if you're not going to be able to breathe through it. Mm. Um, yeah, it's big. Yeah, it's really big. He's a really nice, uh, he's a nice guy and he's also kind of well-rounded as well. Like he plays the clarinet with the um, <laughs> the national orchestra. Like he, and so he's like really high level clarinet player <laughs> and him and his wife, who is the other teacher at the Shala, they have two young girls, like two young kids, and um, so they're really busy, but they kind of um, recognize that other people have other things going on in their life other than yoga. <laughs> so yeah. it's not like um, they don't think that they don't judge you for not kind of nailing bakasana or something like that. It's just like, okay, keep trying. Yeah. And, <laughs> Eventually it'll come. <laughs> and he does a lot of physical adjustments, doesn't he? Yeah, so that's part of the Ashtanga method or physical adjustments, which I love. Like, I mm. think that's one of the things that makes the practice really special. Like, if I don't go to a class where there's no physical adjustments, I kind of feel like there's something missing because you can't, I feel like I can't get into a pose to my full abilities unless I nearly have somebody helping me put me into that Mm. um and it's done mindfully like they all have a lot of experience adjusting 
different bodies and so they do it to just to get you to the edge of what's comfortable and what's not comfortable um, and it definitely helps you progress like because it gets into that sort of I think passive range of movement mm -hmm. that you can't necessarily get into yourself mm -hmm. which is um yeah it's really good like they do a lot of kind of pressing onto the bodies in forward folds or just to deepen and lengthen the hamstrings and um, a lot of assisted back bends as well, which yeah. are super intense. <laughs> as you've experienced. <laughs> yes, as I've experienced. But now I've grown to love um, most days. Some days they don't feel very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny with, with the physical assisting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Dice, who was, uh, you know, he would teach every morning, he, mainly him and, well, and Brian would teach as well. But he would come around and physically adjust us. Right. But a lot of it actually was what they would term yummy adjustments. It sounds a bit weird, but That's a weird. yeah, it's, it's, it, it sounds it sounds weird. But like, um, say I was in a you know I'd, I'd get to a stage where I'm really fatigued and I need to take a rest or take mm -hmm. a child's pose. He'd come around and do like this massage with the heel of his hands in your lower back. Oh, nice. And this is. If I'd have looked at that a couple of years ago and be like, what is this man doing to this other man? I think this looks peculiar, Yeah. but it's so nice. And I thought, what, why do I find that? Why would I, me finding that awkward at one stage in my life is just my narrow-mindedness. Narrow mm -hmm. and, 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 and when he did it, I was like, he was so deliberate with it. He, there was no like half in, half out. He put his hands there, he was firm, but, but tender. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, you know, he's breathing, and that encouraged me to breathe more. I could hear him breathing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, it can be like this. You can adjust to that, that level. And, it, and, it, and um, it made me aware of my, how my back was feeling. And, and even though sometimes the adjustment isn't to for alignment, mm -hmm. it's more so to give you some sensory feedback. Yes. The teacher's there. If they touch your shoulder, for example, they bring you awareness, you have more awareness to your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can say to someone, rotate your shoulder. And they're like, rotate? What do you mean? Oh, Exter right, externally yeah. rotate. <laughs> what do you mean? And then if you and they just touch it, not mm -hmm. even too much, but you're like, oh, like that, and you yes. bring it back. Um, so I've started to be more hands-on. But it's been a real evolution for me because when I did my foundation 200 hours, um, you know, only a year, year and a half ago, I um, they would say to us, you'd be very careful, especially as a man, you know, uh, or ask for permission before you touch a woman right. and and all this kind of thing. And don't use certain words because that would make them feel uncomfortable. Okay. And I, I was scared to my life. Oh, no. I was in class. I didn't go near anyone. I just right. thought, I'm not going to risk it. I'm just not going to. I'm going to stand on my mat, hardly move. I mean, don't get me wrong, the training was good, but that, when it came to physical adjustments, they, were, they weren't they um, were progressive, in my opinion. And um, so um, so now that I've experienced, like with the 300 hours, I, I've, I do it way more. And it mm. makes me so much more part of the class, I feel. Like I'm off my mat, I'm walking around and I'm other, because what happens is if you don't do that, you end up staying on your mat mm -hmm. and just demonstrating everything Yeah. and people are copying you. And then you think to yourself, well, you could watch a YouTube video at home and do this. The teachers really, Absolutely. yeah, some things you have to demo if it's something unconventional, Sure. but generally, um, it, I think it takes real confidence to go off your mat, give an instruction understand that there'll be a slight delay before people kind of get what's going on mm -hmm. and just sit with that delay as opposed to going, oh, okay, just copy me. Yeah. You know? I think um, it's a real pity that a lot of modern kind of yoga teacher trainings and just modern schools of yoga are steering people away from adjusting people. Um, mm. It doesn't have to be a really forceful adjustment. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be sprawled out on top of somebody's back, which I... That's one of my favorite adjustments, so I'm not going to knock it. <laughs> but um, I just think that our society is so hands off of other people. Like, there's no platonic touch. Like, you mm. know, you don't, you, it's very rare to be chatting with a colleague and, you know, somebody have their arm around you. Like, that's, and I think it's a real pity. Like, people think that touch automatically has to be sexualized. And, you know, like somebody doing an adjustment in class means oh god what is the teacher thinking in their head like i think that's a it's a bad sign in our society isn't it like yeah definitely um so i think the more that you can introduce it and keep that as a normal natural part of yoga class the better um and certainly it's 
it's something that you don't ask permission for in uh, in Ashtanga. Like I've never seen, I've never had anyone ask my permission to do anything to me. And at first it was like, oh wow. <laughs> but it's it's been such a good thing, and I think it's really healing having somebody touching you, um, in a platonic way. And like on this yoga retreat, I have this amazing memory where the the wife Sonia at Villa who's an amazing yoga teacher. Um, she had just taken me through a really deep backbend, so an assisted backbend at the very end of the of my practice. And I think, what was I doing? I had, I was bending backwards, I was standing, bending backwards, and she had guided my hands to the back of my knees and had me standing on my own. So okay. if you can imagine that. <laughs> and it was really, really intense, as you might imagine. And. Um, backbends for me always bring up so much emotion. So afterwards, came up out of it, said thank you, and then after that, after those assisted backbends, you go into a forward fold, seated forward fold, Paschimottanasana. And so she um, does this thing. Most yoga teachers do it a squish, which is where they lie on top of you in the seated forward fold, mm -hmm. just to get you deep into it. Mm -hmm. um, and she was just saying, and I was breathing, doing my ujjayi breathing, but quite like. I think it was probably fast and a little bit loud because I was still recovering from the back bend. Mm -hmm. And she just said, soften. She was like, soften your breathing, soften everything. And it was just this like amazing emotional release. Like it was just like giving my per giving me permission just to let go, mm -hmm. um, which I think I don't do very often. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm quite, you know, it can be quite hard on myself. I just expect a certain degree of um, performance, if you will. So. Um, just having that sort of experience, I think you wouldn't get out of a YouTube video. Um, yeah. So I think that's probably what could set aside or set apart a good yoga class from a YouTube video is just mm -hmm. having that personal connection with people that are attending it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you should keep adjusting people. It's my moral of that long run. Yes. No, no, that's a, that's a great, that's a great run. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I intend to, and I think that there there may be one percent of of people who don't like it, mm -hmm. and they can let me. I, I say that as I say that at the start of the class or in the class sometimes. I say, oh, by the way, well, I try to say at the start, obviously, you know, let people let the the powers that be know that if you if you prefer not to be touched. Mm. Um, but if you say it sometimes and make it a big deal, it makes people think, oh, is this something that's awkward? I, I yeah. mean, I, I as you said. The platonic touch is something we don't do. I mean, um, we would, we did some Thai massage in the course as well. Oh, yeah, and uh, really nice. that, that's my next thing that I plan to train is um, either Thai massage or uh, more like yoga focused it's massage you could use in class. Right. Because some of the stuff they showed us, it'd be it, some of it would be a little bit tricky to teach yeah. in class. But it is good to know. It's it's the practice of actually knowing how to apply the right amount of pressure, mm. the where the places are that are best to apply that pressure it's a real skill mm -hmm. knowing how to touch somebody it sounds and even and it shouldn't sound bizarre um but it's something that um as you said we don't do enough of and i i think that it's um it's it's definitely a for want of a better word in the western world more so because when i went to india re, um, recently people stick their arm around you no bother yeah yeah and yeah. uh and uh, I, I thought you know um the first chap I met, who was my chauffeur, I don't know if I said that word correctly, <laughs> chauffeur. <laughs> yeah, You're very posh French there, there, yeah. <laughs> uh, He's my driver. <laughs> he put his arm around me and I thought, I'm just going to roll with this. You know, I'm, I'm my kind of, my legs clenched up and my, my <laughs> shoulders up by my ears. And I thought, relax, Kev, it's all good. Um, just because he was almost like kind of resting on me mm -hmm. and... Um, that's just my years of condition that this is what it's like to be a man. Yes. You do this, that. And I've, I've, I've really changed a lot. And I think um, uh, so much can be said through touch. He was basically saying, I'm cool with you. You know, I feel comfortable with you. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it was a big eye opener. Um, but do you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Jason Crandall, I think it's Jason Crandall. He he, a teacher in the UK. Have you ever heard of him? No, I don't. No, know. okay. It's funny how like <laughs> it's funny how like you know you people you know, on Instagram or or in the, your your little world and you think they're like really well known. Yeah. And then other people never heard of him. <laughs> but he's um, been teaching for twenty years and he has a thing now where you have a tag 
Uh, Patrick Beach has it as well, if you know him. Um, Patrick Beach. I know Patrick Beach. <laughs> yeah. he's, I think he's coming to Dublin soon. He is, next yeah. week. Yeah. No way, is it next yeah. week? Oh. Yeah, next week. Interesting. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so he has tags. You walk into the yoga studio okay. and there's tags on the wall saying touch or no. I think it's just do not touch. You take a tag right. and you put it on the top of your yoga mat. That's what we're getting to. I don't know yeah, how I yeah. feel about that. I know, yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like the people that don't like touch are the people that could probably benefit it from it the most. Like, yeah. I was always so, like somebody who just hated other people touching me. Like, I hated hugs. Like, I was mm. like you, like with the guy in India putting his arm around you. I would have totally just tensed up. And even now, my natural instinct would be like if somebody did that, I'd be like, <gasps> and then I'd be like, oh no, this is okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just so like I think I've benefited so much from that in yoga, like just people touching me, like, um, and I think that it would be a real benefit for people to just be like, no, I never want touch and like stay away from me and. Yeah. Well, I don't in, know. in your occupations, mm -hmm. OBGYN. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of touch there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, isn't that part of bedside manner? Mm. Is that right yeah. Time? There's um, there are particular ways you can touch somebody, um, to keep things professional. And you know, it's a very my job is so intimate. And you know, within one minute of meeting a person I'm asking them to undress so that I can examine their most intimate parts and like for me it's it's nothing like it's just that's my job um and I'm but I realize that I'm asking somebody to really really trust me um and for the most part I haven't had any issues like you know women some are more nervous than others and some have different histories and some have had horrific things happen to them and they usually let me know about it or it's fairly obvious um, just by looking at them. But I think you do have to have some degree of, I suppose, is it empathy or just being able to read people? Um, and I think some people are better at that than others. Um, you know, you can imagine some people, like if you couldn't read that somebody was uncomfortable in that situation, and then they went and did this examination in kind of a offhand manner, it would make the person even more uncomfortable. But uh, yeah, it's it's something you kind of, it's a skill you develop over time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's a funny one because people are always apologizing for different things. They're like, oh yeah, I'm sorry you have to do this. You must think it's so disgusting. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I do it, you know, multiple times every day. Like if I was so disgusted by it, like I'm really in the wrong job. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, but especially in Ireland and in England, but mm. um, we are so, um, I say we because my parents are Irish. I live in living there for 18 years. So, right. you know, I say we, but uh, we Irish people are um, quite kind of prudish for want mm -hmm. of a better word. And it's like, that a part of your body is 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 kind of is ignored yeah. you know and we talked about like a lot with, with jenny Keane and yeah. and had that as you said have night year olds coming in after so many years and, and neglecting themselves and i think um by someone coming into your surgery is that the right your practice your practice, clinic yeah. yeah yeah clinic is clinic, probably a better clinic. word yeah. okay um if if i if i came into a clinic and i had something like that and it was I was a bit embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. I would want someone to put a hand on my shoulder or something, like that, you know, um, and kind of make me feel comforted. I mm -hmm. think that that's really important because there's a lot to be said for bedside manner, as in how people. So I believe you know more mm -hmm. than I do, but in terms of how people heal. I mean, even babies. Um, was it with the Romanian orphanage where they they had that? Um, there was a study done where. The, the babies closest to the entrance were the ones that grew. Did you ever hear that? No, I haven't heard of this. Yeah, so I think it was a Romanian orphanage. They have um, a row of cots, imagine, and at one end of the room is the entrance. Yeah. And they found that the babies closest to the entrance were the most healthy, had the best communication skills, oh, no and way. developed the, the quickest because they were the ones that were held. Right. Simple as that. When visitors came in, they picked up the first couple of rows, yeah. you know. Uh, rocked them a little bit then put them back but the kids that weren't touched mm. um they had massive issues uh, yeah and that's just through touch and yeah. and interaction and someone kind of showing you brief moments of affection 
Yeah, there's that classic study on monkeys as well. I'm sure you've seen the images. It's horrible. But there's they gave a baby monkey the option of either going to this kind of wire cage, horrible, really uncomfortable room, but there was milk. So it had had, you know, the nourish, the kind of physical nourishment that the baby monkey needed, or it had the option of going to somewhere that was soft and sort of um, felt like a mama monkey, <laughs> but there was no milk. Um, so, and they would always choose the soft, cuddly, fake mama monkey yeah. um, instead of going to the milk, which I think is really heartbreaking, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> especially as um, somebody who doesn't eat meat and I don't like animal testing or anything like that, but yeah. it's um, definitely a study that uh, taught us a lot about the value of, I think, touch and affection. Yeah. Um, even in um, monkeys, our, our close, fr our close uh, relatives, you know, they see the value in it as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that, um, that, that we are becoming less comfortable with touch, mm -hmm. less comfortable with conversation as well. This is why, I, part of the reason why I love podcasting, mm -hmm. because the art of conversation is is uh, is dying um I, I was talking to who was i talking to about this the other day anyway it doesn't matter who i was talking to about but they were saying how uh it was max strom actually uh, just name drop there <laughs> their best-selling author but um so he, <laughs> no, no big deal you might listen to this <laughs> yeah he's an alumni as well he, oh, yeah yeah very good. yeah and so um so basically he was saying how like a mother he's seen a mother with a mobile phone yeah and child is in the is in the pram she's wheeling the pram along and she's looking at her mobile phone the child is trying to get her attention he's mm -hmm. a toddler and the child she's basically preoccupied with what's on the phone so two things are happening there one the mm -hmm. child is thinking he's not getting that feedback that eye contact that interaction so right. he's not be, not developing uh or losing uh, certain skills or learn certain skills. The second thing that's happening is he's looking at the phone thinking, what is so important on this phone, mm. this this screen, this device, that when he or she does have that device, and probably like when they're four or five years old, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, whatever age they get now, they think, oh, this is where I, I get my love and affection from, right. which I thought was such an interesting point. It's so true. I, and um, that is, um, that's something that um, I think we're all, we're all affected by. I, I am certainly. Yeah, I know for kind of, um, I was always the person that like kept my phone uh, off, like, you know, in a different room. I wasn't paying attention to it at all. Um, and then I don't, I mean, the recent year, probably year and a half, I've gotten really into Instagram and mm. have, have definitely gone down a bit of a rabbit hole there. Um, I don't know, it's a funny one, because like, I've met some really amazing people through Instagram. But then also, I definitely catch myself ignoring the people around me, because I'm looking at my screen and trying to you know, double tap and like photos and stuff like that. So it's a tricky balance to strike, I think. I don't know what the answer is to What that. draws you into it, though? Why do you use it? Um, you have a job. I mean, yes. for, for me, for example, yeah. sorry, just to, to give you some perspective. Um, Jesse, will you place that cup on the ground? On the ground, just, <laughs> it makes it a bad. Um, from I give you some kind of perspective as to why I'm asking that question. Is mm. year and a half ago when I first started Instagram, I thought, why would you take a picture of yourself and share it with strangers? Yeah, I don't get it. Who you know, share it with your family or don't take a picture at all. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I didn't take pictures much, and then I thought. Um, okay, this is a great way to, to network, to mm -hmm. meet people, to stay in touch with the people that come to your classes. They learn more about you. You learn more about them. They follow you, follow them back. And therefore, when you go into class, it's like the small talk is done. You mm -hmm. can just start chatting straight away. Oh, I seen last weekend you did this. Yeah. Well, and, and, then I, and then I actually started really loving photography. I thought, oh, wow, I actually am developing a hobby here I didn't know I had. Yeah. Uh, or an interest I didn't know I had. Um, so I use it now because I truly I will never ever work for someone else again um, because I've been sacked a few times and I'm, I'm basically like a delinquent when I work is that the right word <laughs> I'm a rep you know I'm, when I work for someone else I don't like being told what to do basically <laughs> I'm not very good at that um, 
and um, I thought, wow, this this Instagram yeah. is a way for me to market myself for free. Yeah, and I can do it in my in my own words. Use it like it's not filtered through someone else. There's no agenda here. Mm -hmm. Everything is completely honest. If you like it, great. If you don't, that's fine. Then you know, we're not going to be uh, connected. And um, I lo I loved how transparent you can be. And then the people that follow you and and, and interact with you are people with similar souls. Um, yeah. So that's my reason. So I'm wondering for you, as someone who's so busy, what do you like about it? I think it's probably similar. Um, I, I mean, I'm not using it to promote myself as a doctor. Like I, that's just kind of that's my that's my side. <laughs> that's that's my day job. Instagram is kind of um, a fun hobby for me. Um, I look at it as my practice journal. I like to, you know, take photos of the asanas, which for me, photographing and videoing my practice has been really helpful for figuring out, you know, I'm like, oh God, I didn't know I was, you know, even today I was looking at a video of myself in crunch asana and I was like, God, I really am twisting my upper torso there. Like that's unsafe. And maybe that's where that pain is coming from. Like better fix that. And it's ah. like, ah, <laughs> so I get valuable little insights um like that and it's also like a creative outlet like i am not a creative person i don't think i am um like i can't i can't draw i can't sing i can't there's you know i'm not kind of traditionally creative so it's been really fun because i can take a photo of myself in an asana and play around with it on an app and make it look better. I think I make it look better. <laughs> no, uh, no, f like retouching or anything like that, but just, you know, putting a few filters on and stuff. Um, and then like the captions are what really are my favorite thing to do. Cause I get to talk about the practice and, you know, talk about whatever I'm kind of thinking about or working through in the practice or like, you know, I'm like, Oh, like, is this what other people like are thinking about as well? Like, are you also thinking about, um, I think I did a post today on tapas, like not the Spanish food, but <laughs> tapas, the practice. And, you know, is, does anyone else relate to this? What are your thoughts on it? Like, mm -hmm. and to be honest, I get a lot of feedback. Um, some of the feedback is just like, you know, beautiful photo or something like that. And it's like, okay, that's all right. But like, you know, I get a few gems and where we get a good conversation going. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I've met a lot of really cool people through yeah. the through the platform and people that, you know, I've actually met with in real life, which was um, something I never thought I'd do. <laughs> it was like, um, but even when I was in Portugal, I met up with a girl called Rita, who I looked up to for a long time. Like she has, like she was running lots of yoga challenges and stuff. And um, I participated in loads of her challenges. Then I got to meet her and she's this really lovely person. And we had this amazing conversation and, um, she has her PhD in marine biology and just like a really cool girl. Um, so it's like stuff like that kind of keeps me coming back. Um, yeah. sometimes I'm like, oh God, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not a yoga teacher. I am never gonna be a yoga teacher. Um, what's the point? But I still love it. Like, I mm. think it's a really cool platform. Yeah, I, I love the simplicity of it. Yeah. And and actually the way you do it, it seems to be, it looks like it's very time efficient. Mm. You 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 have your same, similar background all the yeah. time. You're at home, I assume. Yes. You've got your cat, Bruce. Shout out to Bruce. <laughs> He's listening. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and um, you keep it simple and you do things that look, uh, well, I mean, from a visual point of view, they look, you're very flexible and mm. there's something very appealing about that because a lot of people you know, find flexibility something they want to work on. Um, so you're never going to be a yoga teacher? I don't think so, no. Um, I, <laughs> I don't, oh yeah, that's a tricky one. But no, I don't <laughs> think I'm ever going to be one. <laughs> I suppose you're too busy being an OBG. Well, well yeah. it's not even, it's not the, it's not the time factor. It's the, I kind of look at, I'm a bit selfish when it comes to yoga. Like I practice yoga for me and that's I a good point. Yeah. think that, you have to be really selfless as a yoga teacher, like you're giving so much and you, I don't know how much you get back from teaching other people, but hmm. yeah, we'll see. Maybe, yeah. maybe one day, give me 20 years or so of practice. Maybe I'll eventually get the, the itch to be a yoga teacher, <laughs> 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 but uh, not yet anyways. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, 
What did I say, Ali? Wow, that flew by. You see what I mean? I told Jeez. you. You thought you had nothing to talk about in his yeah. words. Yeah. Um, yeah, was there anything else you wanted to chat about? I think, I mean, God, I think we've covered everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's been an absolute honor. Yeah, thanks yeah. for coming. As always, thanks so much for listening. Next week, I got with me Adam Husler. If you're not familiar with Adam, he is an alignment-based vinyasa teacher. He's one of the busiest yoga teachers in London, has a really cool, interesting Instagram, and he's not afraid to be controversial, very honest, very funny, and uh, a real intellectual. So expect a highbrow, deep conversation between me and Adam, mainly him talking, me listening, and uh, tune in for that or download or stream next Thursday. As always, find it on iTunes or Stitcher or even on Spotify. Thanks again. Have a nice week. Chat to you next week. Bye.